Thank you, everyone. My name is Chris Stauffer. I'm Director of Product Management here at MongoDB. Unfortunately, I'm not joined here by Katia today. She's a little under the weather, but I'm going to take over her slides for her. I'm here to talk about everything that's new in MongoDB 7.0. Before we jump into the specifics, I just want to say, in addition to all the features and functionality we're going to be talking about, we're also going to be talking about some future-looking statements, whether it's new functionality, maybe timing. Just understand that, as in all cases, that's always subject to change. I'm also excited to announce that here at Local, you'll have the ability to access 7.0 Release Candidate. So in addition to talking about it, learning about it, speaking to experts here, you pretty much can download and experience nearly everything that I'm going to present today to you. Go ahead and check it out on Atlas. You also have the opportunity to download it and test it out on your own workstation. Now, because it's a release candidate, just be aware that even though you could use it for testing, you could use it for evaluation, it's not quite ready for production. We'll be announcing it for production later this summer. So with that, I want to just kind of pause for a moment and reflect on all the years of investments and innovation at MongoDB. Just in the last five years, between MongoDB 4.0 and 6.0, we've had major new features announced at events like this. Everything from replica set transactions, time series collections, queryable encryption, stable API. Events like this are where we get to bring new features and functionality to all of you. And I'm excited today to talk through all the new functionality you'll be able to check out in 7.0. We're going to be covering four big areas for you. I'm going to try to cover as much as I can in the 30 minutes that I've got for you. Okay, the first is building on the idea that you deserve the most intuitive and easy to use way to work with your data. We're going to cover streamlined developer experience. We also know that everyone's workloads have been growing and scaling over time. And so performance and scalability is top of mind for all of you. Third, security isn't anything, isn't just something that specific security ex experts worry about anymore. We also need you to think about it if you're a developer or for an admin. And we're going to talk to you about how we're making that even easier. And then finally, you might have workloads in Enterprise Advanced, you might have them in Atlas, you might even have them in Community. We want to show you how you can get those new workloads moving from environment to environment through cluster to cluster synchronization. So let's dive in first on streamlined developer experience, give you an idea of improvements there. Over the last few years, we've been able to continuously add new features to your experience when we're using your query, our query engine. Features like dollar fill and densify make time series more, more easy to use, as well as the ability to look up sharded collection data, even to sort and filter on specific data. In 7.0, we've got a host of new operators, variables, and indexes that are going to be available for you. And let me go ahead and take you through them individually. First, you're now going to have the ability to approximate percentiles in aggregation which means that before, instead of a multi-step process in order to get percentiles to use for your services or for your end users, you're going to be able to compute them using a single command. You'll have the ability to do that across documents. You'll be able to group them or use them over a window, even work on an array of values. We use the T-Digest algorithm to make it fast and accurate for you. Let me give you a working example of how that might occur. Let's say you've got a set of vacation rentals, and you want to get a sense for the prices for each city. You want to be able to get the 50th, the 80th, and the 95th percentiles to be able to display them. Now, with the new operator for dollar percentile, you'll be able to add a dollar price for your input. You'll then be able to provide the percentile values. And then from that, you'll get an output quickly, providing you with those percentiles by city. You'll be able to tell what those stats look like, and you'll be able to send them back both to your services and even to your end users. In addition to working over groups, you can also look at percentiles over values as well. So for example, let's say you want to calculate the median of review scores for individual rentals. You want to give a sense to your customers exactly you know, where, where are they 50th percentile for each one of the listings. You now can use the dollar median operator. The dollar median operator is going to allow you to pass in your scores. 
and out of it, you're going to very quickly be able to use that data in your user experience. In addition to approximating, sorry, approximating percentiles, we're also making it easier to work with bitwise operators. If you're one of those people who love to pack a lot of data into your fields and use them for bitmasks, these are the features for you. So now, when you have a field that represents multiple data points, whether it's permissions, settings, status, you can use bit end, bit or, XOR, or not to be able to make smart decisions in your aggregations. To give you an example, here's an aggregation query. And let's say we wanted to annotate whether the people in your system had a certain write permission based on a bitwise operation on a field called dollar permissions. In this case, I'm going to use the dollar bit end. And from it, I'm able to extract if the permissions value for each one of my documents contains that one, one zero or, or value of two. In this case, we'll see that Jane Doe has access to perform write form rights. We're also going to see John Doe, unfortunately, hasn't earned that permission quite yet. In addition to bitwise operations, we're making it easier to work with user roles. We have a new system variable that will provide a list of the user roles associated with the database user that's executing the command. This can be accessed in queries and can be used in reads, writes, and view definitions as well. A great example you can check out here is when creating your views. So currently, you have to, when creating a view, if you wanted to have selective data based on those roles, you'd have to create a separate view for each custom role and then assign those roles to individual users. If for some reason the logic changed, you'd have to go in and modify multiple views. In the new setup, you now have the ability to use the dollar dollar user roles variable to create a dynamic view. That means you write it once, you encode the information, custom logic, and then if it ever needs to change, you only have to change it in one place. An example here would be in a situation where you have a CSM team application. For example, you might only want your CSM app folks to be able to access customer contract information. In the example provided, you can now create a view where the custom contract details are only going to be populated if that user has the role CSM app. In addition to variables, we're also making big improvements in time series collections. Now, we had a whole talk on it earlier today. And if you've been there, um, I, you know, I'm not going to steal any thunder. Um, check out the talk online. Uh, it's, it's hugely impactful, I think, to your, to your development experience. I do want to call out, though, that in 7.0, we're improving on the ability in time series for arbitrary deletions, including deletions for single and multiple documents. That means if you have sensor data that you discover is bad for some reason, now you can selectively go and potentially delete that data out. And we're also excited to say that in the future, we're going to be having that same support for updates as well. In addition to the ability for arbitrary deletes and eventually arbitrary updates, we've also made significant performance improvements as well that's going to make sure that we can work on your largest set of time series data. And finally, partial TT Partial TTL indexes is going to make it easy for you to age out your data in a more fine-grained, controlled sort of way. If you didn't check out the talk today by Mike, please check it out online. I think it's going to be available next Monday. In addition to time series support, we're also adding better support in our indexes. So compound wildcard indexes now support the ability to perform against multiple fields. So you'll be able to pin a compound index against an arbitrary field as well as an always present field. This is going to be a game changer for those who have multi-tenant environments. Let me give you an example here. Let's say, for example, you have a product catalog. And within that product catalog, you have different sellers. And within each seller, you have products with a variety of different attributes. In many cases, you're going to want to search on those attributes, but you're also going to want to filter on, this, filter on the seller, maybe even on the stock. Now you're going to be able to do that using a simple index construction. You can pass in information like seller ID, a wildcard index on attributes, as well as name and stock. And then you can do something sophisticated, like find all my low inventory stock that have a certain material but are specific to this seller. 
all of these queries are now going to run highly optimized, and it's going to make it a lot easier when you're writing your code. And finally, change streams is improving as well. In 6.0, we announced the ability to look at pre and post images for a change stream event, which meant that not only would you get an event with the new set of data, you'd also have access to what the data originally looked like. One limitation we had there, though, was that it was limited to 16 megabytes in, in its entirety. So the event itself would have to be under 16 megabytes, which had a limit for the individual documents. Now we've got, in 7.0, the ability to handle large events exceeding 16 megabytes, which means instead of just being able to receive those events, we have the concept of a large event listener. When, when you use this listener, it's going to give you the ability to actually split up those events into individual fragments, each fragment being less than 16 megabytes, and then you have the ability to put those fragments together and then process that, process that event as a whole. In addition to improvements we've made, queries and indexes, chain streams, and other areas, we're also making improvements for those of you who are working with sharded collections. In, in 5.0, we had announced live resharding for clustered collections, which meant that even though you had a sharded collection, you had the ability to reshard it on the fly later on if you decided that for some reason you wanted to change your sharding key. Perhaps your data changed or your usage patterns changed. Now, going into 7.0, we realized that there's still some challenges with choosing that shard key. And in order to aid in that, we're rolling out a new set of commands that'll make it a whole lot easier. The most notable command is called analyze shard key. Analyze shard key is going to return a set of key metrics that are going to make it easier for you all to decide if a shard key has the fitness to be the right shard key for the future. Because the analyze shard key also relies on sampling both read and write traffic, we're also going to give you the ability to configure that sampling rate as well. Let me show you how it works. For analyze shard key, when you execute it with an existing or new shard key, you're going to get information about cardinality, frequency, and monotonicity. The idea here is to give you everything you need to make sure you're choosing a high car cardinality shard key, one, with, which, one which has a lot of unique values. You're going to want to also spot if you have a low frequency for some of those values, in the sense that you don't want a single shard key to appear in too many places. It's also going to help indicate if you have a shard key that's either monotonically increasing or decreasing. And that's important because you want to make sure that ultimately the majority of your load doesn't land on a single shard. Now, looking at the data is only one part of it. You also need to look at the traffic patterns that might emerge when using, uh, using a new shard key. So we're also going to be sampling data. Now, the sample data is going to help you understand query routing patterns. It's going to be able to tell you whether your queries, reads and writes, are hitting one shard, multiple shards, even the distribution of those shards. It can help you understand if there's hot shards in the configuration, help you make the best choice for your sharding key for the future. In addition to managing your sharded collection, we're also going to make it easier for people who are developing on both sharded collections and uncharted collections. Now, we know there's some commands that behave differently if you're doing it on a sharded collection, namely update one, delete one, and find and modify. Now, there's some good reasons for that. We want those those commands to be able to be optimized to be performant and target individual shards, but we also want the ability to have them execute on a broader set of shards when necessary. So starting in 7.0, we're now going to have the ability to use update one, delete one, and find and modify in the same way you'd use any other command. In 6.0 right now, you'd have to provide information like the shard key, you might have to provide underscore ID, or you might have to target a shard key directly. In 7.0, you're now going to be able to match on any field. Now keep in mind, you're still going to have both the old support and the new support for these commands, which is to say that the fastest way to update a single document in a single shard is always going to be to target that specific shard. But in use cases where you expect to update multiple shards or you don't know where the data will reside, you now can use this new format. In addition to making it easier to work with the data, in, in addition to making it intuitive, 
we also want to make sure we're improving performance. Now, every feature we build at MongoDB goes through its own iterative process to try to improve performance. But there's two big areas I want to call out today that are going to improve performance, especially for those using sharded clusters and also for people who are using our query engine, which is everyone. The first one builds on existing functionality that we introduced in 6.0. The idea that we could defragment our sharded collections and reduce the number of chunks on those shards has led to significant performance improvements. Now, we introduced this in a previous release through defragmentation. Starting in 7.0, we now have the ability to run that in an opportunistic and automated way. Auto merger which is going to be in 7.0, will now build on that defragmentation. The idea is that it merges all ranges of contiguous chunks that reside on a single shard. And by doing so, reduces the sharding table that tracks where your data resides. By doing that, without having to move data, by being able to execute fast, quickly, is going to make sure that you have the fastest experience on your sharded cluster. In an example that we saw with customers, we saw up to a 60% reduction in shard count in the sharding routing table. And we also saw examples where write latency reduced by almost an order of magnitude during sharding maintenance operations. The second major performance improvement, which actually got announced by Sahir uh, at our keynote, is our new query engine. It's a multi-year effort to deliver the next generation of query performance, extensibility, and efficiency. It's going to be running for nearly every type of workload that you use when you execute a find, whether it's grouping and reshaping, filtering and sorting, or dollar lookups. It's also going to be used in most aggregation pipelines as well. So here it called out the significant performance improvements, and I just want to emphasize them again. In grouping and reshaping, we've seen improvements of up to 50%, or 50% reduction in latency for those operations. Dollar match and dollar sort saw almost a 90% improvement in latency. And dollar lookups were orders of magnitude faster. If you're interested in learning more, we have additional talks on this, kind of going behind the scenes and learning how our engine works. In addition to those two big performance improvements, I also want to call out the investments we're making to improve on security. Queryable encryption was announced for a preview in our, in our 6.0 release, and we GA'd it here at this event. Now, queryable encryption is something that's accessible to every developer, right? It's a developer to every environment, and it provides an industry-first, end-to-end, fully randomized encryption. The idea that you could encrypt your data on the client side and never see it decrypted through its entire life cycle is truly revolutionary. In addition to it providing the next level of guarantee for performance and security, it also aids in developer productivity. You can imagine now that your developers don't have to know the internals of your encryption scheme. You don't have to worry about com complex cryptographic methods. And developers can now focus on what they do best, which is building great applications for your customers. In addition to that, we're also announcing OpenID Connect support, which is available for Atlas customers, on-prem, for customers who are using Ops Manager and Cloud Manager as well. Previously, you had to use LDAP or Kerberos for something like single sign-on for human users. Now you can go into the Atlas UI, you can go into Ops Manager, Cloud Manager, configure it, and you're up and running. You can authenticate via MongoDB shell as well as through Compass. You can also use uh, your IDPs for database authorization. And finally, you'll have support for, uh, for o OIDC SASL for your drivers as well. In addition to those two major announcements, there's a number of key improvements we're going to make on the security side as well. One is X509 parameters are now configurable for intranode auth. Driver support for identity management across cloud providers is now provided. And OpenSSL 3.0 support is now the standard in our server product. So when you're downloading our software and using it, you know you're using the latest security capabilities. 
In addition to security, in addition to performance and streamlined developer experience, we want to make sure that if you're using community, if you're using on-prem, if you're using Atlas, we want to make sure that you have a great experience in moving data between those environments. And the answer to that, when we announced it in 6.0, was this, cluster-to-cluster -cluster synchronization. Cluster-to-cluster -cluster synchronization is our continuous unidirectional sync from same, similar or different environments for MongoDB clusters. The key use cases that we see all of you benefiting from this are, are not just migration, but also we know our customers want dev and staging environments as well. You want to be able to make sure that the latest data is available, maybe for your development process. In addition, there's, there's needs where you want to have it for audit and compliance, as well as analytics as well. All of those use cases are supported, but we also understood that in each one of these cases, different data might be necessary. In some cases, even different topologies might be necessary for your target environments. So starting now in 7.0, first, you're going to be able to filter on the data that you want to send to that target environment. Using, using new parameters, you'll have the ability to choose either the database or the database and collections that you want to target. For staging environments or dev environments, maybe you're only interested in a specific database. For auditing, it might be specific collections. All of that is available now using these simple parameters. In addition to the data that you can choose, we're also going to make it so that you can transform the topologies over time as well. When we initially released uh, Mongo Sync, you had to make sure that the environments match topologies, which is replica set to replica set, or sharded cluster to sharded cluster with the same number of shards. But now we have unlike topology support, which is going to make it simple for you to actually transform from one topology to another. This means for two sharded clusters, you can go from M to M, but you can also go from M to N shards. You can even go from replica set to a sharded cluster. And the idea here is because the target topology may not always have the same requirements as your source. Perhaps you're looking to upgrade or try a new environment. The topology might change. Let's say you have a dev or staging environment, but you don't need a large sharded cluster. Maybe you need a small sharded cluster. Or maybe you're looking at going from replica set to sharded cluster, and you want to evaluate that experience. All of that is possible now with unlike topology support. And finally, for those of you who have experienced Atlas Live Migrate, you don't have to, for those of you experiencing Atlas Live Migrate, you can now know that Mongo Sync, or cluster to cluster synchronization, is the engine that's actually driving Atlas Migrate. So that means that when you go into Atlas and you choose to migrate a workload, if you're using 6.0 and later, you're going to get the fastest migration, the one that's most resilient to interruption, and the one that also allows for the most set of features. And with that, I want to just take a pause here. I want to thank everyone for taking the time to hear about the new 7.0 features. I hope what you've heard about streamlined developer experience, performance, security, and migrations, really exciting for you. They are for us. Thank you. Okay. And with that, I'll take some questions. There are any from the group? I guess it should. It's on. Hey, I have a question on the data sync. Uh, we tried on the data sync on the 6.2, but it was complaining about the time series collection, which is not supported. Is it supported in 7.0? Let me, you might have to come up. I, is time series collection supported in 7.0? Are time series collections supported in 7.0? Yes. Yes. The data sync, sorry. I forgot oh, the data it, sync it, part of it. Is, it. is it supported in Mongo sync? It's not supported in six. Is it supported in six? It's going to be supported in seven. There you go. Yeah. Anyone else? You know you want to. It's your moment. Ask a question. <laughs> okay. <It's>... Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank, Thank you. you so much, everybody. Thank you, Chris.